or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's going to come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't want to be there. One last time, this don't have jack shit to do with a kid not wanting to be on a TV show. Um... Hello, everybody. How are you doing on this fine Wednesday? I'm doing quite well. I have a very busy day today. It is 634 in the morning, my time. Bam does have court today, which I'm going to be going to, and I am going to be on Prim's podcast this afternoon. I don't know when this video is going to come out. I'm going to try and get it uploaded now, but we'll see. So if you watched my video yesterday, you will know, or if you've been anywhere on the internet for the last few days, you will also know that there has been a Dan Schneider, Brian Peck, Nickelodeon Come to Jesus docuseries that has come out. Now, generally, in my opinion, I've said it many times, many ways, you can go back and watch those videos, but generally, in my opinion, I did like the documentary, I enjoyed it, I was glad that the survivors were able to speak their piece, you know, say what had happened to them, I was glad that they were able to take back the narrative, because it doesn't seem like they really have been the ones pushing the narrative forward for quite a while. Um, the criticism that I did have of the documentary lied with the fact that the adults who were adults at the time that all of these abuses were perpetuated were kind of cast in the same light as if they were child victims. And I took a little bit of issue with that. Another issue that I took with it was that I found that, in my opinion, it seemed like everybody that was perfectly willing to participate in this debauchery, including by way of writing scripts, designing costumes, not speaking up, doing anything about anything else. All those people now want to all point the finger at Dan Schneider. Uh, some people also want to act like they didn't know a lot of stuff was going on. And I just find it to be not believable and not credible. That's just my opinion. I was not there. Now, just about one hour before I aired my video, premiered it yesterday, and right as I was editing another video, Dan Schneider himself put out an apology. And I think it's kind of comical because I've been watching apology videos on YouTube for like what? eight years, 10 years at this point is pretty much a genre. It's the white sweater, the white hoodie sitting on the floor in front of your bed with the tissue wiping your eyes. This is basically the industry standard version of that. And let me show you what I mean. So here's Dan Schneider's actual YouTube page. Um, blink and you miss it, but this guy right here in this thumbnail is actually Dan Schneider. He doesn't look anything at all like he used to look and like we are used to seeing him. It looks like maybe he got a hold of some semaglutide, some ozempic or something. I don't know. But this does not look like the same person as Dan Schneider, but it is apparently. So this is his YouTube channel. And if you go to sort the videos by date, you will see the last time he posted a video on this channel was three years ago. Of course, he used to post content about the kids with the kids, the different, you know, kids from his shows and things. And then the last video he posted was a victorious virtual celebration where the cast reunited for the 10 year anniversary. And then nothing seems to have happened on this channel till yesterday. And as you can see, it's already got 317,000 views. A lot of people are very interested. The title of this video is Dan Schneider Talks About Quiet On Set. Now, I have watched this video. It is 19 minutes long, but I wanna watch it again with y'all and just give some of my thoughts. I won't bury the lead, I'm actually going to be in agreement with Dan Schneider on a lot of the things that he does say, but hear me out. That doesn't mean I'm letting him off the hook for anything that he did, but we have to use nuance. If we don't, then we are allowing these documentary companies, these media conglomerates to decide the narrative for us, which isn't the point or the purpose. And we're going to be lost at sea until we decide to start deciding for ourselves. You know what I mean? So let's go through this video. We're going to use a little nuance here. I will point out the comments are turned off and they have been since at least an hour after the video was uploaded. When I saw the video, a bunch of y'all let me know about it immediately. And so I saw it very early on. I saw it within the first hour it was posted and it, the comments was already turned off. I don't think the comments were ever turned on on this video. Now, I will say, and this is speculation, this is just opinion and speculation alert, but in my opinion, it seems like there is a larger sort of invisible hand at play in the situation of this whole PR media narrative push. It almost is starting to shape up to me, 
in my opinion, as if a large corporation, a large media conglomerate corporation, such as perhaps Paramount, such as perhaps as high up as Viacom, NBC, uh, maybe as low down as Nickelodeon, but some corporate network, in my opinion, or conglomerate is sort of presenting the American public and the global public with a narrative that is palatable in order to rehabilitate not only Dan Schneider's reputation, but all of the people who allowed these abuses to happen. That would involve allowing these survivors to feel as though they have had a voice and their story has been heard. That would allow Dan Schneider to apologize for what exactly we will see. But I kind of get the sense, and this is just speculation theory, that this is a whole entire PR push, which includes this Dan Schneider apology video, which includes the actual docu-series, and which may include even some people I've never heard of making YouTube videos all of a sudden. It could not. Again, I don't know. I'm just doing a little media evaluation. I don't want to get too caught up in this intro. So let's just get to uh, the video, and I'll start giving some of my... Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Ball and Nickelodeon's I Carly. First of all, this is going to be a long video, so grab a snack. But first of all, I have questions. I, I was a little bit aged out of Nickelodeon and Disney and stuff by the time iCarly was really in its heyday. Um, so I didn't really watch iCarly. I'm sure I saw a few episodes or whatever. But uh, what in the hell is Boogie doing on this channel? Again, remember, we are on Dan Schneider's YouTube channel. And the first thing when I click on the video entitled Dan Schneider Talks About Quiet On Set... Hey, it's Boogie, some random actor from iCarly. Okay, giving Nickelodeon push. Now, as this video, I don't want to, you know, bias y'all. You should go. I'll link the video down below. You should go watch it on your own without my commentary. Um, there's a whole video out there that exists without me talking. So if you don't want to hear me talking, go click that one. It's in the description box. But just off the bat, they got an actor. They have an actor, an actor, a self-proclaimed actor introducing himself by two not birth certificate names, right? Hey, it's Boogie, the actor who plays T-Bob, another actor. Like, you know what I mean? It's kind of like, what is this push? Why couldn't it be Dan Schneider with a white hoodie on his floor like we're used to seeing? It's like, it's not a traditional media platform. This is not a MSNBC interview. This ain't Oprah. This ain't even somebody's YouTube channel. It's Dan Schneider's YouTube channel. That would be like me needing to do an apology video for some reason and having an actor come on and say, hey, it's Boogie. I asked that surprise witness if she would be willing to talk about the expose. And thankfully, she agreed to come on her own YouTube channel and do that. Why Dan Schneider didn't go on Boogie's YouTube? You know what I mean? Like, it's just, it's too manufactured that it makes it feel surreal and it makes it feel like it's just like a movie set or a TV show set. It's not feeling authentic in any way in the first five seconds of this video. You know what I mean? Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Bow on Nickelodeon's iCarly. I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something that he'd be willing to discuss. I'm pleased to say that he said yes. Like, this is such a scripted script. Dan, how are you? I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the... You know what it's also reminded me of? That time that Lima, Mora, Omar, Abdullah, Takali, Takali, Takwali, Yeremovich, 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 April, went on to, to No Jumper podcast, and then they had to kind of, like, tell the story at the beginning. Like, how did... How did she end up here? Like, how did Boogie end up on Dan Schneider's? What are you talking about? Oh, I had a chance to reach out. Like, it's just like that, where it was like, I reached out to Mark. And then Mark, I asked him if you would be willing to tell me on your channel. And then he was like, yeah, no, well, she, he's the devil. And all that, we had to listen to that whole backstory. That's what this is given. What we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is important. For sure. Uh, we've got a lot of things to unpack. Um, but before I dive into my... Buzzword, buzzword. This is important. Unpack. Yeah, we have a lot of things to unpack. List of topics that I'd like to discuss. Is there anything you'd like to start off with? This is so scripted in my opinion. Okay, Boogie, when we start rolling, what we're going to do is you introduce, you say how we ended up here, and then you give me a chance to say what I need to say first. Then I'm going to do an apology. Absolutely. Watching over the past two nights was very difficult. Me facing my past behaviors. Um, some of which are embarrassing and that I regret. And I definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology. I'm going to say like Rabbit says, name names. Who? What past behaviors? Which ones are you talking about? 
Who do you owe an apology? Why haven't you given that apology? He's not going to say. He's just very vague. And it's just kind of like the same feeling as that docuseries editor herself being like, the system really needs to examine itself. No. The legal system, the criminal justice system really needs to examine the individuals who perpetrated this depravity. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watch. Again, I, I, I told y'all it's going to be a long video. I got eyeliner on my thumb and it's waterproof. The f I think it's important. We're going to do a little media analysis here. I think it's very important. The very first allegation that Boogie wants to talk about is the massages. And that was egregious. Again, I want to reiterate, no employee, female, male, any gender, any sex, whatever, should be having to give their boss a public massage when that is not part of their job and they are not a massage therapist. So I think it was egregious. But you know what I think is really egregious? The racist costumes that they had on these black children. The racist tropes they had them doing. You don't care about racism? Fine. What about the sexual innuendos? What about the overtly sexual words they were having the kid? No. The first thing that Boogie asks about is kind of blurring the lines of abuse. In my opinion, there is a stark border, boundary, line, threshold between the abuses suffered by minors who could not even legally enter into contracts and the abuses suffered by people who were willingly showing up to work every day. Yes, I understand people got to pay bills. I'm not stupid, but there is a difference. And if you don't agree, that's fine. You don't have to, but I'm not going to change my mind. Why is it that the first question that was asked wasn't about these kids? Why? Let's talk about the massages. Watching the content yesterday, that was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. Nobody's name is mentioned. I apologize to Kathy. I apologize to Jan. I know I apologize to anybody I ever put in that position. And again, it's very bad that what he did. I agree. It's very bad. But don't you kind of see how it's kind of sort of like more of a blurred line because it's adults and is it sexual? Is it not? It is just a massage. You might have to go to court and get it sorted out versus I had a 12 year old calling herself taint. I knew what taint meant. Everybody knew what taint meant. And I'm not sorry about it. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village. Or he apologizes to the random people walking around Video Village. He apologizes to the people giving him the massages, but he don't name any names. But I don't hear him apologize to the children that had to witness this behavior. Wherever they happened, because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw. Another question about the willing participants that were the adults. Also, also, they have already been sued over this and a court has already determined or maybe it was settled outside of court. Actually, let me not let me not get ahead of myself. But this has already all come out in legal documents what they're talking about. In my opinion, this is a PR push to divert the public's attention from the abuses faced by children at the time from child abuse, from child exploitation, child labor law violations, child endangerment, breaking families apart, crimes against children. In my opinion, this whole thing, including the documentary, is an attempt by some powerful corporation to divert the public's attention from those allegations. And like Serge Del Mar says, kids can't consent. Why are we talking about the writer room before we're talking about the children? It's a choice. It's not illegal. But I'm just saying we got to be critical and examine this and evaluate it. Not cool. No, no. And I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room ever, period. Buzzword, buzzword, buzzword. No writer should, but. The end, no excuses. Um, most. TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that. Most people have done it and they're aware. They were aware of what they were getting into. But even still, I guess I was. A lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. 
Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. And therein lies the answer. He's embarrassed. He's not sorry. Um, and I can tell you why it hurts really bad for me. Um, I remember very clearly. And then here's some Lima Yavrimovich off in the weeds personal story that nobody asked for, where he talks about being a writer and everybody was nice to him. My early experiences, my first experience. Which supports my industry plant speculation. I mean, his daddy went to Harvard. He was a, a extra on one movie before his breakout role in head of the class. I mean, it seems he was installed from the very beginning. In the entertainment business, I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that the, and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. Somehow, somehow the man has managed still to make it about himself. The fact that I abused people hurts my heart. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, in the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far and um, that was wrong. It was just a joke. He was just joking and it just went too far. And that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced producer. I was immature. Excuse. Excuse. It didn't happen today, but um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. Now, we know you've had a lot of success over two decades. And Boogie also is a terrible interviewer. The man hasn't asked a single follow-up question in three questions. It's clear to me that he's got his little notes app up and he's just got the questions written down. He lets Dan answer them. He looks down, he asks the next question. After Dan answers a question, he goes, yeah. Thousands of people have worked with you for you. Okay. Let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience with you. Okay, I would like to speak to those people because I hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time. You know me, you've been on my sets. Um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20. And I think there's our answer. Why is Boogie doing this interview? Why does it need to be an interview? Why couldn't Dan have sat there like a regular YouTuber on his YouTube channel and just addressed allegations himself? Because he needed someone to be able to look at and go, you know me, is a good narcissism tactic. I'm not saying he's a narcissist, but I ain't saying he ain't. I'm just not qualified to diagnose such a thing. But it gives the American public the perception that he has support. He has a friend, a black friend, no less. It's not a coincidence to me. I think he tokenized this man. I think this man was chosen because he was black to do this interview because there were a lot of allegations about racism. And here's Dan Schneider going, you know me, you have been on my set, Boogie. You know me. We've worked together for years. No, no, I'm not convinced. 20 years who would work with me again not everybody there's a still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me so my batting average isn't nearly high enough in that area um and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that i would let the pressure of doing 40 or even excuse more episodes per year i would let that pressure get to me which a good boss should never ever do there's specific things that you were doing Sh sure i would um snap at people sometimes mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. And None of those things are illegal also. And what I think is interesting that he leaves out is I would send DMs to the employees telling them to shout depraved and self-deprecating things about themselves. I would send DMs just for shits and giggles and fun and saying, shout, I'm a and then if they didn't do it, I would send it again in all caps. He left that part out. Isn't that interesting? And watching that show, there were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry and let's talk about it. And I, Yeah, I bet you wanted to do some PR damage control. I, I wish you'd had a better time and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. No. Boogie. Yeah. Next question. Look at him looking down, reading it. You've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Uh -huh. What do you think of that? 
false. It's a, it's an inaccurate, it's an inappropriate and inaccurate contextual framing of the question before the question gets off the ground. Some people think that some jokes were inappropriate for children. No, ma'am. No, sir. There are writers from this show saying that they on purpose named Amanda Bynes character a private part. And then they had her saying it. And then they covered it up and lied about it. Not now looking back in retrospect, that's an offensive joke. No, ma'am. They knew it at the time. That's left out. I don't hear them talking about that. What they are doing is gaslighting and Boogie is helping and he ought to be ashamed of himself. He's another one that's doing a, whatever he has to do for a paycheck or for a friend or whatever. So desperate to be involved in this sick world of Hollywood that he's doing this and making himself look like a fool, like a court jester. Huh. Oh, you know, actually, maybe those jokes are inappropriate. No, they were inappropriate at the time. Foot fetishes for children existed at the time. People putting peanut butter on a child for animals to lick it off of their bare chest was inappropriate then as much so as it is today. So sitting here framing this question, Boogie, as if it's like some sensitive woke justice warriors or some shit on the internet that just can't take a joke. No, the shit was inappropriate at the time. It was inappropriate then and it's inappropriate today. It will be inappropriate in 20 years to put a bare chested child out there to get licked by animals to put a live scorpion in a child's mouth, to basically waterboard Ariana Grande off the edge of a bed, to have her moan and milk a potato. Even some of y'all have been saying, I knew what was going on then. Let's hear Boogie ask, ask his question again. Let's see, hear what Dan Schneider has to say. But I will warn you, it's nothing but excuses. It's nothing but pointing fingers and blaming. Now, you've written hundreds of episodes. Thousands of jokes have been told. Yeah. But currently where we are, uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children. Uh -huh. What do you think of that? All these jokes that you're speaking of, um, that the show covered over the past two nights, every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Okay. Um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, let's cut those jokes out of the show. Just like I would have done 20 years. Let's cut those jokes out of the show. So the collective American public has no memory and no recollection of exactly the egregious nature, the depravity of these shows. Let's get rid of the jokes. Let's just cut that part out. Let's absolve Dan Schneider from any and all possibility. I mean, the shows are only going to be about five minutes long then at that point. But that's not what anybody's saying, Dan. They're saying you ought to be held accountable for the fact that the jokes were inappropriate at the time. And jo these on-air dares weren't jokes. The gallons of sugar being poured into the kid's mouth where they were choking, the coffee, the caffeine being going into the kid's mouth, that's not a joke. That's not a joke. It's child abuse. And so reframing stuff as a joke is given Steve-O the failed clown. And now Dan just wants to erase it all from, erase it all from the collective consciousness. He wants the Mandela effect us. And I bet I know why, because a lot of this stuff coming out, we were all like, oh man, I kind of remember this, but I didn't remember that. I didn't remember this. I didn't remember that. He wants to wipe it all so he can start fresh new with a new kids show. Years ago or 25 years ago, I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like, it. the more people who like the shows, the happier I am. Yeah. So he wants the shows to be popular, not ethical, not moral, not appropriate. You notice the words he's choosing. He's telling you who he is. I want my shows to get views. I want my shows to be popular. I want people to like them. 25 years ago, they liked them and now they don't. So let's delete all that and start over. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to say. When what needs to be cut is Dan Schneider from Nickelodeon. He needs to let it go. Let the dream go. He needs to be interrogated. He needs to be investigated. This isn't so simple as cutting a joke. The damage is done, buddy.
What in the hell is cutting the joke going to do? What in the hell type of solution is that? That's about as useful as the system examining itself. If your work, mm -hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. Cut it. Cut it. I mean, that's not a solution. These two morons sitting here trying to convince me like that's something that's going to help. No. That's a solution. The, the last thing I want to ever do yeah. is put any content in a show that's going to upset my audience and make them want to. That's true. He didn't want to upset his audience, but he did want to, in my opinion, in my opinion, he did want to make content for perverts. In my opinion, he didn't want to upset his audience. He wanted the kids to like the stuff because that was his first and foremost job. But he also wanted to make perverted content for his own sick depravity and giggles and for his friends, in my opinion. That's what I think. I think he got busted in retrospect when we all look back and realize that he was being nasty. He was kind of like perverting all of our collective innocence. Turn off the TV. Why would I ever want to do that? That makes sense. I want to give you an opportunity to kind of elaborate on something. Okay. The thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what, it's going on TV. You just had that type of power. Is that true? The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny, okay? We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts okay. of, of, of approval. Coasts. Yeah. Two coasts. Yes, and, not, and by the way, approval at every stage, really. Okay. And I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sound. So he's saying, I'm talking about the phalluses on the costume. I'm talking about the time that they called Brian Hearn charcoal colored. I'm talking about the prosthetic nose. So he's looping in all the people who had to have participated here. And you know what? I unfortunately got to agree with him. This isn't absolving him from any responsibility. But it is kind of like he's getting used as a scapegoat. He's the one that everybody's piling on to. But who did put that prosthetic nose on that child? Who did put that makeup on them kids? Who did put those bald caps? Who did sew those leotards? Who did put the phalluses on the leotards? Who did fill those vats full of sugar? It was a bunch of people. Nickelodeon absolutely greenlighted every single thing that Dan was doing. Otherwise, it wouldn't have made it on TV. That's, that's a good point, and he is right. All of these depraved jokes were approved by rooms and rooms, levels and levels, full of adults. That's dialogue, jokes, everything. <clears throat> now, when you say approval, these obviously that's a hierarchy, not your no, colleagues right. or people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleagues. No, these are my bosses. Bosses and then their bosses and then their bosses. And they're approving all of this stuff. Okay. Okay. And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher. He's right. And He's right. It's true. Why didn't they do anything? And the families, everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that. That's not appropriate. You then, it would have been cut out. Now, I'm mm. going gonna, gonna to push back a little bit. I do think that's true. But I think Dan always had the opportunity to explain himself. And we get it in that taint joke where Nickelodeon executives did come down to Dan and say, oh, isn't that a private part? And then Dan being like, you're so perverted for thinking of that. It means tainted or whatever. And then that allowed Nickelodeon to say, oh, yeah, ooh, plausible deniability. What Dan said is that it's not that. Y'all are being perverted. Like, so there were stop gaps. But let's say Dan wouldn't have been able to come up with any excuse for that. Just like, haha, isn't it funny? It's It's sex. Maybe Nickelodeon would have put a stop to it. But what he does say about if anybody would have said that something was inappropriate or whatever, then it would have been cut. Maybe that's true. But that person would have been cut, too. And we saw that with Brian Christopher Hearn. He was not invited back to the second season of all that because his mom was doing exactly what Dan just described. And so when people did raise concerns, they were iced out. Whenever Drake Bell's father raised concerns and he was trying to be on set, like Dan just described, he was trying to be on set and watch his child and all of that, he got iced out. The producer, the dialogue coach or whatever, Brian Peck, wedged himself in between the relationship of father and child. And so actually it doesn't even seem from reality like what Dan is saying is even true. But I also agree with him. Probably not many people did say anything to him. Probably not many people did push back because they didn't really have the authority to because he was a tyrant. Bitch, sure. because the series made you in this way 
that you were just the guy that was doing what he wanted and mm -hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay, if nobody on the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say... Look, I'm getting all worked up. Anything. If my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you've got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. Now this next one. It kind of so he really didn't push back on that. So Dan Schneider doesn't actually say none of my jokes were inappropriate. He doesn't actually say I, I wasn't making stuff for pedos. What he says is it's the system. The whole system allowed it. And it's obvious to me, in my opinion, in my perception, my perspective, that the reason nobody said anything is because they were either actually legitimately scared or they were in on it, too. Everybody knew what was going on. It's very hard to watch a lot of this stuff and even see it as anything other than sexual as an adult. And I promise you at the time, the adults also felt that way because we got it from them. One of the writers said, yeah, it was a little bit much how often the feet were featured. It was a bit much how often they were doing the face shots with the squirting and the thing on the face and all that. It was. It was. She didn't say, oh, looking back on it now, it was. She said, no, I noticed it. So adults at the time did notice it, but they just let it slide. And that's Dan's get out of jail free card, literally. Everybody else let it happen. So who are you going to blame? They all were in on it. I'm going to hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed to, to my child being in the entertainment industry. It doesn't matter what age. Yeah. Seeing some of those on air dares. That tells you everything you need to know. The man's been on these sets and he would put his kids on them. He's one of them. Seen it now from where you are now in your life. What do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their... Which ones, though? Again, no specificity, no name and names, no calling it out, and no apologies. Just vaguely some went too far. Which one, Dan? A version of Fear Factor. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. So we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of Fear Factor sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff. But we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give them to the network and then they would say, one, tell us the ones that were okay. Right. Those are the ones we shot, those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it Didn't he just say some of them went too far? So is it that they actually went too far and objectively you shouldn't have been putting children in these situations? Or is it these silly little kids that had problems with things and they didn't even know how to express it? It's like he don't even stick with his own same logic. He don't stick with the same logic. See how quickly it went from some went too far to... Now I know kids had problems with it. I didn't even know. You just said some of them went too far. So just pick one. It breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. To it breaks his heart that the kid who he had kicked off the show because his mom was asking questions had problems. It breaks his heart. Did it break his heart to kill that, crush that kid's dreams? No. Any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't. Any kid. No names, no specificity, no specific apologies. Want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period. The end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I would, I would have changed it. Well, there was a kid getting licked by dogs with, with peanut butter all over his body saying, I don't like this. On the spot. Now, we also saw the series highlight two former writers of yours, two women, mm -hmm. who spoke about a way- Again, I feel for these women. They shouldn't have had to be, you know, abused at work and things, but it's not the same as the kids. And I do not like how they keep just going back and forth. Kid victims, adult, willing participant. Like, I don't like it. It's just, I feel like it's intentional. Age discrepancy. I know that you don't divvy out salaries. I know. I'm your friend. Here I am vouching for you. You don't divvy out salaries. It's not even your fault about this wage stuff. Talk to me about that part. 
Well, you're correct. I have nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never made a writer's deal. And of all the writers I've been in a writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Yeah, but we saw these two women who were writers for you sharing one salary. How mm -hmm. does that happen? It's very simple. There's a common practice in television when hiring writers. If you have a spot for a new writer, sometimes you'll go to two writers and say, hey, if you two new writers for your first job are willing to share a salary, you can both have the job. Mm. They have the opportunity to say, yes, that sounds good, or no, no thank you. In this case, it was two women writers. I've done another show where that teaming was done with two male writers, and they split a salary. I did another show where it was a male and a female writer, and they split a salary. So and these are all first-time writers? All first-time writers looking for their first gig. Got it. Now in the series... Y'all know I'm not on the Dan Schneider uh, defense brigade, but I actually do find that believable. I do believe that. I, I feel like Dan Schneider probably is a sexist. I think that he was having women perform these massages and stuff, like, and probably not men. I do think that he probably is a sexist, in my opinion. But I also do believe that it is industry practice for if you tell them, you're going to have to share a salary, but if you both agree to it, then you can both have the job. Otherwise, only one of y'all is going to get it. I do think that probably is true, and I do think it probably is true that men and women both on Dan Schneider's sets have done that. Um, does that make it right? Well, no, but I think that's a different situation than he was paying women half the salary because they're women. That's not the same thing. So nuance is important and it's important because you don't have no credibility if you just dogpile on somebody without using logic. Then it's like, well, you're just dogpiling. I need the logic. They also highlighted two black actors who said that they felt overlooked. Now, I want to be clear. I'm never going to speak on anyone else's journey. I think it was yeah. three. I can talk. About oh, yeah. Here we go. This is this is Boogie is about to earn his paycheck, in my opinion, right here. About my experience how my experience was. This is why Boogie is on this channel, y'all. He needs to be the one who's vouching. So not only is he a former co-worker, a former employee, but he's a black man. And now he gets to basically discredit all of the black children who were children at the time's experiences that they already came out and talked about. With you, what I saw prior to working with you, but again, I don't want to speak on any. Then why are you speaking? He don't want to speak on anyone's behalf. But here he is speaking as a black man. I mean, it's pretty coded, but I can see what's going on here. One's journey. I saw you be honored for diversity in your work. Yes. And the reason for that. Some award that Dan Schneider probably made them create. Is diversity has always been very important to me in my shows. If you go back to the very first Nickelodeon show. I, I do think diversity has been important to him because he had these black caricatures that he needed to play out and make fun of black people with, and he needed black kids to do it. Ever made, that's very evident, as it is in the second one, and then the first movie I ever made for Nickelodeon, which starred Keenan and Kel, and every show I did after that had a lead. Because when you go back and watch what he was having the black kids do, it was a lot of racist and racial stereotypes, like pretending to be a drug dealer and the fried chicken and the good burger and the being dumb at good burger. Like a lot of it was like making fun of black people through these black children. And I mean, I, I certainly didn't notice it at the time. Also at the time, it was a lot more common for that type of jokes to be on TV, on adult TV as well. I think we have made some progress since then, but just because you had black children on your shows, just because you were paying black children, the diversity is empty and moot if the diversity depends on stereotypes. And that is literally what was going on. Captain Big Nose comes to mind. Black actor in it. I'm very proud of that. It's very important to me. And not only am I proud that they were in my shows, I'm exceptionally proud of the achievements they've had beyond my shows. And they've gone on to bigger and better things. And that Yeah, Keenan is a star. Gives me a great sense of pride. Well, something that really kind of bothered me was how they depicted your relationship with the cast. Yeah, it bothered me too. Yeah, just me being there, I knew the dynamic was trust. I understood another vouching another vow. This is why Dan couldn't have come on his channel himself. He needed his buddy old pal Boogie to come and vouch for him that in situations where they may have had turmoil, whether it be with their families, whether it be other castmates, they came to you versus how they made you look. 
With that said, Amanda Bynes was brought up in the series mm -hmm. and her emancipation and how you were involved in that. Can you talk to us about it a bit? Sure. Um, Amanda was between the ages of 16 and 17 and she wanted to get emancipated from her parents, mm -hmm. which was a fairly common thing with successful young actors, at least at the time. Sure. Um, and she wanted that for herself. So she turned to her team, which included her lawyer, her agent, her manager, her publicist, me, because she included me as part of her team, thought of me that way. We supported her. She tried to get emancipated and it ended up not working out. And she didn't. Well, since we're here, let's stay here for a moment. There was also an incident where she had ran away. So other people were involved, so it couldn't have been too bad. Away from home, if yes. you would. Um, can you talk to us a little bit just to clear the air of exactly what happened in that situation? Yes. Uh, one night, it was very late, well after midnight, one or two in the morning, phone rang, I answered, it was Amanda. She was upset, she was in distress, she had had some conflict with her parents, I think her father, and she called me. I was immediately concerned about her safety. I called someone who I knew was fairly nearby. That person was able to go and pick her up. Then I knew she was safe. I felt better. She ended up being taken to the police. Well, regardless of what some people may think, I think it's only positive that you are there for people when they need you. I don't know if that's true or not. If what Dan Schneider just described is true, I really think that's pretty okay. Like a kid he worked with, 16, 17, calls him up. It's one, two in the morning needs somewhere to go, how to fight with her dad. He lets her come. Then he calls the authorities. If that's true, I don't think anything's wrong with that. And in fact, if there was a 16, 17 year old in my life who got in a huge fight with their parent, who, I mean, we know what this dad is like already at this point. Like, I don't find it hard to believe that Amanda Bynes would be getting in fights with him. And she was the breadwinner of the entire operation, not only her entire family, but the entire show. If somebody was in a position of distress and they called me and they were 16 and they were 15 and they were 17, something like that, I would absolutely allow them to come into my home, spend the night. I would feed them and then, you know, get in touch with authorities or get in touch. Like, I, I, they can't stay there forever. But for one night, you know, if, if what Dan Schneider's saying is true. But in my memory, I'm going to have to watch this whole docuseries again because I think I just watched it all too fast. Um, and it's all kind of blurring together now. But in my memory, she was there for a while and it was like the cops found her there, which is not the same as what Dan is describing. Now, I do want to mention quickly the fact that it's all blurry in my memory. I don't want to discount that because if it's blurry in my memory and I'm doing this kind of for my job, you know, reporting on the different findings, reacting to the different findings and things, then that definitely means for the average American who's just going to watch that docuseries one time and then not ever again not ever really think about it too hard again it's all gets all blurred up who's the villain in the documentary is it nickelodeon is it dan schneider is it brian peck is it that handy guy it who is it the parents is it the kid who's the villain it's very hard to figure it out in fact it just says the dark side of kids TV and the director's prescription to fix it all is the system examining itself. So who's the villain? It's, it's blurry. You know what I mean? And I don't think that's necessarily an accident. That said, let's talk about some of the things that have just been swirling forever. Okay. You were banned from your set. Never, never, never happened. That is a false rumor. What happened? This is just an ego. I don't even care about this. I don't give a he was banned from a set. Add it to the list of false Talk rumors. to me. What happened? They were adult actresses at the time, and they had their own specific reasons for not wanting to do the show anymore. Mm. I'm not judging that. It got tense, and what they don't know, maybe, is I did everything I could to make that show go away. My producer partner at the time, we would call and say, this is a not a good situation. Okay. So I, I decided I'm going to do what most showrunners do, which is, you're not on the set. There's a director there to shoot it. I'll go up to the writer's room. I'll work on the next script. But yeah. because everybody was so used to me caring about every detail of every show so yeah. much, for me not to be on the set, yeah, maybe some people thought I got banned. So it was more of an assumption because this guy's usually here and now he's not. 
I don't know if it was an assumption. I don't know if somebody thought they were making me look bad by saying I got banned uh, from the set. I have no idea. Okay. All I know is I was never banned from the set. Yep. The darkest part of this series discussed child predators. Now, I want to make sure that we clear... Including Dan Schneider. A couple of things up. Okay. Brian Peck was not hired by you. No, I did not hire Brian Peck. This was a Tolan Robbins production? Yeah. And when Drake and I talked and he told me what had happened, I was more devastated by that than anything that ever happened to me in my career thus far. Mm. And I told him, I'm here for you. What do you need? Which Drake mentioned in the show that we watched last night. And next, I heard that he went to court when this guy was being tried, Peck. It was a production company that hired people. Okay, fine. The corporate structure was such that Dan Schneider was not the person in charge of hiring Brian Peck. Fine. That can be true. And Dan Schneider could still be the one that said hire Brian Peck. Couldn't he have gone to his friend and said, hey, I like this Brian Peck guy, hire him. He didn't say he didn't do that. He didn't say he didn't recommend Brian Peck. He didn't say he didn't know him. He didn't say they weren't friends. He didn't say he was just some weirdo that he didn't like. No, all he said was technically I didn't hire him. So let's, let's do this. You have a boss. And your boss is hiring for some other position. And you say, oh, boss, I know a guy. His name's Brian Peck, Pickle Boy. You should hire him. And your boss hires him. Did you hire him? No. But isn't there a little bit stronger relationship there than just, I'm not saying that is necessarily what happened with Brian Peck and Dan Schneider. But what I will say is if Brian Peck was not invited to be on the set and if Dan Schneider did not want him on there, he would not have been. He was there with the permission and probably invitation of Dan Schneider because that's how Dan Schneider even described his own self. He was tyrannical. Nobody was on those sets that Dan didn't want there, including the kids, the parents, the mothers, any of them. So I didn't hire him technically, doesn't get him anything with me. And when Drake walked in, he saw 50 people sitting on the side of the courtroom supporting Peck. A lot of them pretty famous. Of course, Drake was devastated that that happened. And, and even more disappointing, 41 of those people wrote letters for Peck, character letters, praising him for who he was and asking for leniency. And they knew that he was guilty. They knew he had confessed to some degree mm -hmm. and they still did this. Isn't that convenient? There's some other creepy pervert that Dan Schneider can point his finger at instead of answering questions about why he allowed the stuff to happen on his sets, why he allowed predators to have access to children. It's just, that's baffling that adults would do that. Yeah. And I don't know if people know this, but Drake's mom, a lovely woman who I stay in contact with this day, she came to me at the time and she said, Dan, I'm not good with words like you are. And would you help me? Somehow he got to remind everybody how good at words he is. He's got to keep building himself up throughout this entire thing. Drake's mom was so incompetent. She couldn't even write her own speech. And I had to help her because I'm Daddy Dan. Me with my speech for the judge. And I said, of course. And I did. And he ended up going to prison and serving his time. And yeah, that was probably the darkest part of my career and here's the kicker that I really don't get after he got out of prison and was to my knowledge a registered sex offender he was hired on a Disney Channel show I don't get that either that's one other thing me and Dan Schneider agree on I, I, don't, I don't understand that um, I never yeah I don't understand yeah. I appreciate you sharing that, man. Are you okay? You want to take a minute? No, I'm all right. Let's, let's keep going. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. I think we really unpacked some important things. We set the record straight on a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Before I let you get out of here, I appreciate the 
vulnerability that you use in knowing that there's definitely th before i let you leave your own youtube channel probably his own house or a set he runs things that you would have and should have done differently mm -hmm. is there anything that we haven't discussed anything that if you could go back and navigate the, the journey differently what would that look like um yeah there's definitely things that i would do differently um one that i think would be really really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job. That yeah. they I'll stop you right there. I'll stop you right there. <clears throat> Who's paying the therapist? The same people paying the writers? Because if that's the case, they're still going to be too scared of you to actually do what needs to be done. Second of all, a licensed therapist, a licensed therapist is there for the purpose of mental evaluations and helping people with them, is there to diagnose mental conditions. They're not there to predict who wants something. That's, a, that's what a psychic does. And I guarantee you, 90 plus percent of the kids on those shows who were auditioning for those shows really wanted to be on the shows. It has nothing to do with what the kids want. What I think Dan is kind of saying without saying it is, I would have these kids psyche valed in order to determine who was going to be the most pliable, the most malleable, and who was going to be the least likely when they're 25 to 35 years old to expose my ass. Who really wants to be there? What does a kid really wanting to be there have to do with anything? If a kid really wants to be there, but you're working them 20 hours a day, you're still the problem. If a kid really wants to be there and they're getting taken home by Brian Peck and you know what, nightly, what does it have to do with the kid really wanting to be on TV? If the kid really wants to be on TV, but their mother isn't allowed to say, hey, I don't want my kid being in this racial scene, this racist scene. What does that have to do with a kid really wanting to be there? It's like it's coded language. I think what would be better instead of us having to change anything we're doing is to put all the responsibility and blame on these stupid, dumb kids who are ungrateful and who are now exposing me. I wish there was a therapist out here who had screened them to tell me who was going to be the squeaky wheels later on. And then that way we could have got these slackers off the set and only had mind control robots. That's what I would do. I mean, that's what I'm hearing Dan say. Tell me if you heard something different. Really wanted to be on television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it going to mean? if? Maybe they should be informed. <laughs> I don't know about y'all, but every legitimate job I've ever had told me what was expected of me before I started. I mean, even the law job, they said you're expected to be responding to our emails 24 hours a day. So I hope you're a light sleeper. I chose to go into that. Now, once the job started turning into stuff I didn't agree to, I quit. But maybe in Dan's estimation, maybe it would be helpful if the kids were informed of what the job entails before they accepted the position. No shit. Duh. Y'all weren't doing that? And I, here's Dan on here out here saying like, well, maybe that's what we should have named. Maybe that's what they should do. Like he didn't have full control over doing that. You didn't tell the kids what it was expected of them before they started? That's a you problem, sir. Now you're acting like the whole system is, is doing that. You could have done that. This, in my opinion, is all just Dan Schneider trying to gear up to have another kid's show. Because, listen, he's still calling it we. Maybe we could have, maybe we could have a therapist on set. I think would be really, really important is when you're hiring young actors, minors, to work in television, I would suggest that we have a licensed therapist there to oversee that process for the specific reason of making sure that those kids really wanted to do this job, that yeah. they really wanted to be on. Not for the specific reason of protecting the children, not for the specific reason of making sure that everybody is respected and nobody's going to have be traumatized when they're 25 years old and they look back and they had went through all. No, not for the specific reason of safeguarding their innocence, for the specific reason of making sure that these little kids, these brats actually even want to be on a set.
you see how we're all off in the weeds? We're all off in the weeds. We ain't talking about feet and juicing potatoes and moaning in a bed and Penelope Taint. Mm -mm. We talking about the kids who didn't want to be on TV because that's really their problem. According to Dan Schneider is that they never really wanted it in the first place. And so because of that, now they're mad. Now they're upset. Or when they were doing the on-air torture live on air, they didn't really want to be on TV. It's literally, I could hear him saying it to those kids 25 years ago in my mind. Do you really want this? Then get out there and slather yourself in peanut butter. Do you really want this? Then moan whenever you're milking the potato. Do you really want this? Then put your head on Danny Boy's shoulder in the scene whenever the camera comes through. Do you really want well, If not, you don't really want it. Like that, that is cult mind control tactics. Television. Yeah. Maybe they should even be informed about what that means. What's it going to mean if you're famous? What's that going to mean on social media? What's it going to mean within your family? Yeah. Let find out. And then that way. If Maybe you should have told them, Dan, which you were in complete authority to do. If a kid doesn't want to be on a TV show, they can opt out. Yeah. That, that psychologist, that therapist could come to us and say, I really don't want to beat a dead horse. I really don't. But I feel like it's very important to point out here. This has nothing to do with a kid wanting to be on a show. I didn't hear one person in the documentary and the docuseries say, I never wanted to be on TV. Actually, looking back on it, I, I, don't, I didn't want that. They all wanted to be on TV. What they didn't sign up for was the abuse, was the breaking child labor laws, was the breaking the law is what they didn't sign up for. They went into it thinking that you weren't going to be a criminal. And I'm not saying he is innocent until proven guilty, but this has nothing to do with kids wanting to be on TV. Of course, the kids really wanted to be on TV, didn't all of us? They, this kid is, is, doesn't want to do it. I don't think a psychologist would have let any of these people screen out. I don't know if y'all have seen the show uh, Unreal. It's a scripted TV show about the directors and producers of a reality show. And I think they tell you a lot of secrets about what really goes on in the Hollywood of it all in the show. But that's one of the things they have one, on one of the seasons. A psychiatrist or a therapist comes in for exactly this reason, to make sure that they're not abusing the contestants and abusing the workers and stuff like that. Well, the psychiatrist therapist guy ends up having an affair with one of them. He ends up being, you know, he's paid by the networks and stuff like that too. And it just ends up being like more of the same. There's another person there participating in it or whatever. And it's like, who's paying this person? Who's paying the licensed therapist? Dan? Where they, where's their Who's their boss? Because if they're going to slow down a production, they're going to get fired too. They're just going to put in some licensed therapist. So the next time somebody gets exposed for a big scandal, Dan can add to the list of fingers to point. There was a therapist licensed on set that pre-screened everyone. They just need more people to layer in and point the finger at because the end result is inevitable whenever you put these, in my opinion, in charge of production. Or their parents aren't, aren't uh, understanding of what's gonna come. And then we could avoid the mistake of ever putting a kid in a TV show that didn't wanna be there. One last time, this don't have jack shit to do with a kid not wanting to be on a TV show. Um, and additionally, the main thing that I would change is how I treat people. And every You should have left everything else out other than that. Everyone. I, I definitely at times didn't give people the best of me. I, I didn't show enough patience. I could be cocky and definitely over ambitious. And I made people yell and I'm an idiot and bend over desks and pretend to be, you know what? And sometimes just straight up rude and obnoxious. And I am so sorry that I ever was. And um, all right. when I watched the show, I could see the hurt in some people's eyes and it, made me feel awful and regretful and sorry this sociopath behavior right here because either the man's lying which or it never really crossed his mind that people could have possibly been upset as adults over what he put them through as children um i wish i could go back you know especially to those earlier years of my career and bring the growth and the experience that i have now and just do a better job and never ever feel like it was okay to be an ass to anyone ever. Um, look, I, I wanted to make funny TV shows for kids and we definitely did that. But if I could go back, 
I would get it done in different ways. I he never said I would not put the little girls in the bikinis. I would have not had them making sexual innuendos. I would have maybe come up with different last name than Taint. He didn't say none of that. He didn't specifically name anything wrong that he did. It's all vague. I didn't give people the best of me. I was overly ambitious. I was stressed out and I should have handled my stress better. I'd just be nicer as often as possible. I'll be nicer as often as possible so that I could still keep getting away with when I wasn't nice is what I'm hearing. And listen more to the people on my team. And um, I would do everything that I could to make sure that everyone had a good experience. Uh, that's what I do differently. Dan, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Thanks for stopping by, man. Thank you. I'm still, I'm still hung up on the thanks for stopping by whenever we on Dan Schneider's YouTube channel. Where did he stop by his own YouTube? Imagine, imagine Boogie or somebody come on my channel, that's Prize Witness TV, and tells me thanks for stopping by. And then I upload it on my channel. Who has the password to that channel? Dan Schneider. Who uploaded the video? Thanks for stopping by. Please. Anyway, I got to go get ready for court. I got to go. I'm going to try to edit this video. Um, that's all I really had for today. I will be back very soon with a BAM court update. I'm sure this developing story, I'll have more to comment on pretty soon. If you're not keeping up with Rabbit's coverage, you should definitely check out Down the Rabbit Hole News because she is doing responses and reaction videos to this topic as well. Uh, check out the BJ Investigates podcast that we did release an episode on this just yesterday, the first episode ever. Eventually, that is going to be a members only podcast for the first week but then it'll become public um after a week or whatever and lastly me and prem also have a podcast really it's prem's podcast the just prem podcast it is going to be linked also in the description below we're going to be going live today so that's all i really have for today in the meantime thanks for stopping by facts ain't defamation love you mean it okay bye